Hello, I'm Willie George. Welcome to this edition of the Faith Roots Podcast. So glad you joined us. And we're talking about this week the importance of casting vision and the two elements of vision casting. There are two. One of them gets neglected, perhaps a little more than the other. So we may focus a little bit more on the first element, but they're both very important. Now, let's go back and recap. We've talked about the four things that every leader needs to know. The first one is you've got to be a self-starter. Secondly, a leader has to have confidence. And we talked about how you get that confidence, where it comes from, and how that confidence is transferred. The third thing that we talked about is how a leader delegates. And we didn't just talk about the process of delegation, but we talked about how do you choose the right people to delegate to. And we also talked about if Jesus delegated and he had all the Holy Spirit's anointing there was to have, how much more important is it for us to delegate who do not have all the Holy Spirit's anointing there is to have? And so we cannot really fully enter our ministries until we delegate. And the same principles work in a business. Then I want to come to the last thing, and that is the important element of casting vision. Okay, Habakkuk 2.2, King James Version. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain upon tables, or in other words, make it plain on tablets that he may run that reads it. Followers cannot run with a vision until the vision has been made plain. Now, this is a very important concept, very important principle. Let me explain what I mean by a vision being made plain. You cannot act until the vision is plain. Back in 1993, uh, late 1992, we were developing plans to build our first building. We didn't have funding yet, but we couldn't even approach funding fully till we had a set of plans for our building. Now, we had uh, done a lot of, of prep work. Uh, we had brought sewer into our property. We had done some other things to get ready. We had purchased the land we were going to build on. Uh, but And we had some artist renderings. And I had two different sets of architects. And uh, I had the first group of guys that I really liked. I, I gelled with them. I, I got along with them greatly. I, I really liked being around them. But my building project manager, who was a member of the church, who was an engineer and had built numerous large buildings and had a great deal more experience in major projects than I did at the time, um, this guy was very upset with the architects. And one of the things he said to me is, Pastor, we cannot know what this building is going to cost until these guys give us a complete set of plans. Well, it was so bad that we finally jumped into a new architectural firm, and they began to work on a complete set of drawings. Now, I didn't understand that. I went more by how I felt when I was with the architect than I did by what the architect was giving us. And because I liked the first two guys, I didn't fully appreciate what we got with the second guy till much later on. The second team came in and did a complete set of drawings. Now, here's what I mean by that. They put into the drawings every toilet, every light switch, every light fixture, how thick the paint should be on the walls, all of the different finishes where everything was. It wasn't just concept. They had all the specs down. Now, this is what the building project manager told me. He said, any time the subcontractor comes and looks at your plans, and sees them to be incomplete, if he is submitting a bid because there are so many unknowns, he will typically pad his bids by 20% or sometimes even more. You will not get the best price. Even if it doesn't cost him what he thought it was going to cost him, he will still get the 20% because he bid that and you accepted it. And so he impressed upon me the need for a finished set of plans. I'd never fully understood that. What it said to me is until the vision was plain, until it was brought into focus, nobody could really run. 
Now, if you're driving down the interstate highway and you know you've got to get off on interstate uh, or exit 67, for instance, and it's a particular street name, and you're driving along and you see uh, a sign in the distance, you know you're getting close, but until you can read the sign clearly, until that sign comes into your focus, you cannot turn. You don't turn off the road a mile and a half early. Uh, you don't want to run into the ditch. You want to turn exactly when you're supposed to turn. When do you do that? When you are able to focus. Focus enables action. Focus empowers action. Many leaders are so general in what it is that they present to their people, they never get specific action. And I want to show you the difference. Definition has to be specific, not general. All right, now when you do not give specific information, let me tell you what your followers do. They develop their own rules. They come up with their own plans. They do things the way they want to do them. That's why it's so very important that you are specific in how you lead your congregation. Or if you're a businessman, how you lead your business. You have to lay it out. Now let me read to you from the book of Exodus. This is a leadership principle that was clearly understood by Moses. God told it to him in the very beginning. And in fact, Moses would have had the capacity to receive something like this because of his training in the Egyptian army. Uh, now, Josephus tells us that Moses was an Egyptian general who had great success. The book of Acts agrees with this, that he was mighty in words and in deeds because he had ra been raised as Pharaoh, uh, at the daughter or the son of uh, Pharaoh's daughter. And so he was royalty. Some even say he was in line for the throne. Now let me read Exodus 18.20. This is after the Exodus and Moses has taken the children of Israel across the Red Sea. And this is what God said to him. You shall teach them the children of Israel, the statutes. Now, statute is a boundary. That's really what it is. Teach them the boundaries and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. In other words, you teach them what their behaviors are to be and what their assignments are. Many times we only cover the assignments, but we don't cover behaviors. Behaviors are part of of the vision casting, behaviors, and the assignment. Two different elements here, according to Exodus 18. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 25. When uh, Saul became the king of Israel, then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Now, this is important. He gave written directives as to how the king is to conduct business and how he is to behave personally. That was what Samuel wrote down. So there are two different elements here, your testimony and your function. And a lot of people have a function but don't maintain a testimony, and as a result... Uh, they wind up being compromised and lose their ministry. So it's important that you and I have these two elements. We have a walk and we have work, and that's what's listed in Exodus 18.20. Love that passage. Now, the scribes of Israel were very faithful in all these things. They copied the Torah and all of the scriptures faithfully for hundreds of years. In fact, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found and they were about 2,000 years old, and they were compared to modern-day texts, and there, it was remarkable how similar uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls were to the modern-day texts that had been copied by the scribes. Uh, it is this attention to detail that God chose Israel for. You can say what you want to say, but no other group of people would have been as consistently faithful to the text as what the Jews were, and that's the reason that God chose them. Now, details do matter. They matter a lot. You know, I'll just be honest with you. I, I'm amazed today how many people do not follow Jesus' instructions in prayer. And I want to read specifically what he said. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, John 16, 23. 
and in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Verse 24, until now you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. I'm blown away at how many believers, even pastors, when they pray, address their prayers to Jesus. He very specifically said, you talk to the Father. Now, you can, you can talk to Jesus and tell him that you love him, and you can talk to the Lord about uh, maybe the assignment you've been given because he is the head of the church. But when you're praying for a thing, you go to the Father, and you go to the Father in the name of Jesus. Nothing could be more clear. Now, it used to be about 50 years ago, we don't hear this much anymore. And a lot of it had to do with the teaching of people like Kenneth Hagin. Kenneth Hagin was amazingly faithful to teach prayer in the name of Jesus. Now, when I first became a follower of Christ in 1970, it was amazing to me how many people prayed for Jesus' sake. And Kenneth Hagin and several others like him taught the importance of praying in Jesus' name, not for Jesus' sake. After all, they said, we are not asking something that's for Jesus' sake. It's for our sake that we're asking this, but we don't pray for our sake. We're praying in Jesus' name. And over time, people changed. But now I see we've gotten a little bit slack again. And we've got people praying every which way, shooting prayers off, uh, uh, really not thinking about what they're saying. Details matter. They do matter. Now, it's amazing to me how the same leaders will follow details down to the letter when it comes to dealing with their teams but they don't follow details when it comes to talking with God. And both are important. I'm not trying to be legalistic here, but if the Scripture says it, then we need to do it. We need to have great honor for the detail of Scripture and follow what the Scripture really says. Now, listen to the attitude that Jesus had about the Scripture. He said in Matthew 5, verses 17 and 18, "'Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets.'" I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Jesus had an incredible regard for the Old Testament. When I see people today who put the Old Testament down, don't even want to teach it or talk about it, I think, man, you don't have the attitude that Jesus had toward the Old Testament. Now, we don't live under the Old Testament, but there's a lot we can learn from it. And Paul, when he said all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, he wasn't talking about the New Testament Scriptures because they hadn't been written yet. They hadn't been canonized yet. He was talking about what God had spoken through the holy prophets of the Old Testament. So you see, God has a tremendous regard for what he has uttered, and he moves his kingdom forward. Now, how does he do it? He does it through the power of focus. Focus is hugely important. You cannot do through maintenance what must be brought about with focus. Now, this is what we're going to talk about this week. Uh, there are two different kinds of work. There's focus work and there's maintenance work. If you're putting in a flower bed at your house, you cannot put in a flower bed by maintenance. You can rake the ground all you want. You can water around the base of your house all you want. That will not make a flower bed. You are going to have to put some very intentional work into the soil around the base of your house. You're going to have to create some borders. You're going to have to get all the grass out, the weeds out. You're going to have to choose certain plants to put in your flower bed. You're going to have to come up with a watering system. So there is a tremendous amount of focus. You'll have to put some fertilizer down, probably some mulch. There will be a number of things you'll have to focus on to get that flower bed in. Now, once it's totally in, you shift gears. And no, you're no longer in a focus mode. You're in a maintenance mode. And all through the New Testament, you see these two things working together. Now I want to give you Acts 14 very quickly, and we're going to read with verse 21. It's where we'll start. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Okay, That's Paul and his team. That's focus. They had an intense focus. They returned then to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. Uh, what they're doing. They went back to the people they went to before. 
what are they doing? They are putting elders in place. They're teaching people how to maintain what they won through focus. So you see focus, then maintenance, focus, then maintenance. And that is a pattern that works all through the scriptures. And so you cannot have great breakthroughs if all you do is maintain. Maintenance is important, and there's a time for it. But there's also a time for breakthrough and focus. And without focus, you'll never have your breakthrough. We're talking about the difference between focus and maintenance, and both are elements of vision casting. And I'll show you how all of this works, but focus is something that um, we don't pay enough attention to. We, we don't separate these two ideas, focus, maintenance. And sometimes it's, it's, it's appropriate to maintain. Other times we have to give place to focus so that we can have the breakthrough we want. The object of focus is the establishment of something new. Nothing new is ever established without focus. Listen to Acts 16, 5. And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. Now, how did that happen? The apostle Paul and other apostles went out and they preached and they were intent on bringing new churches into being and getting them strong. So these churches were established. That's the idea behind focus. Now, this one verse encapsulates both ideas, focus and maintenance. Now, the last part of that verse where it says they increased in number daily, that's maintenance. The first part of the verse, so were the churches established in the faith, that's focus. You can't build a building by taking a mop and mopping the dirt. Now, there's a time when you will be able to mop your floor, but you don't build a building with maintenance activity. You build buildings with focus activity. You cannot clean a building with a hammer and a saw or with a bag of concrete. You can't do that. So you see, there are tools that we use for maintenance and tools that we use for focus. And the two are necessary, but they're totally different. Focus is meant to last for a season. You can't maintain focus unbroken for a long period of time without wearing out your people. I knew a leader that was extremely gifted. He may have been the best offering taker and the most inspiring offering taker that I ever saw, but the guy never let up. Now, it was okay in the beginning when you first got around him because he was always casting vision and doing great things and people jumped in behind him, but he never let up. There was never a time that he let his land rest. You know, I grew up in an area that was severely impacted by the Dust Bowl. And the people of my parents' generation would often talk about the Dust Bowl. And they would talk about all of the shelter belts we had in the area. They would explain how these long rows of trees got planted back during the Depression in the Dust Bowl era. We didn't have those trees on the plains where I lived, naturally. There would be some cottonwood trees and maybe hackberry trees down in the bottoms by the rivers and creeks and little clusters, but in farms and out on the top, we call it where the Mesa tableland was, uh, there were no trees. And so the soil could not hold because they overworked it. They, they put way too much stress on the soil. And uh, for years, the soil produced for them, but eventually it lost its nutrients. It couldn't hold a crop. And then the winds came and it blew the soil away, which is what created the Dust Bowl. They came along to help the farmers uh, hold the soil, and so they planted these rows of trees. They'd have tall trees, and then they would follow it up with shorter, thicker trees. And so you see in the bottoms of the shelter belt, you'd see a lot of cedars. So the, 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 the shelter belt would have high and low canopy, and it became a haven for more animals and so forth. It, it pretty much changed 
uh, the ecology of the reason, a region. And so what I want you to see is I grew up with that, and I saw what happened when you deplete your soil. And I thought about this pastor as a farmer, and I thought, you know what? He's going to run out of steam here before long. He's going to wear out his people, and that's exactly what he did. He, he, he never quit pushing. They never rested. There was never a time for saying, okay, let's maintain for a while. Let's consolidate what we gained. It was always push, 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 special offering, special offering, special offering, all all the time, and he wore out his church. And, uh, you know, I, I probably raised more money in the long haul than he ever thought about, but I didn't do it by taking special offerings all the time. I was very careful to mind our people. We would put special pushes on. We would have a goal. We would go after something. And then once we got it, we would celebrate it. We'd use it. We'd move into it. Everybody got a chance to enjoy it. And then when the next season came for us to put a focus on, we would go after that. So we had times of focus, then maintenance, focus, then maintenance. And that's how God ordained that these things work. Now, let me show you how this works in the book of Genesis with Abraham. Uh, now, the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land that I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation, and I'll bless you. I'll make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. That's Genesis 12, 1 and 2. So Abram had been given some instructions to refocus, to move. This is major. This is not a maintenance thing. This is not go out and take care of your flocks and just keep grazing where you're grazing. God said, leave, go to a different place. And so we see that Abram departed, Genesis 12, 4. As the Lord had spoken to him, Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they'd gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. So there was a change of focus here. They're in a different place than they've been before. Now look at this. This is verse 7. And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. So we see that God dealt with him once he got there. He confirmed the move that Abram made. There's a breakthrough here. Abram received a revelation that he's to go to the land of Canaan, so he packs up and goes. It takes a great deal of focus to do this. They're not doing routine things when they move to the land of Canaan. They're doing something that's totally out of their routine. But they get to the land of Canaan, and once they get there, God confirms they're on the right track. Now, I want to show you what happens in verse 9. And it says in Genesis 12, 9, Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. Uh, years ago, I heard John Osteen uh, bring out this uh, passage and uh, fascinating. Uh, what he did is he showed us the margin here, and it says traveling by e easy stages. And he talked about that's how God leads. Abram journeyed traveling by easy stages. Now, what's going on here? He's in maintenance mode now. In other words, he has focused. He got to the land of Canaan. God appeared to him and says, I've given you this land. And God would appear to him again to confirm it. But there was a lot of maintenance going on in between. In other words, he was to walk up and down through the land. When God says walk up and down through the land and go east, west, north, south, and everywhere the sole of your foot treads, that will I give to you. He was maintaining. He was taking his flocks out. He was uh, taking them to new pastures. He was taking advantage of what God had told him to do. He was actually living out uh, the breakthrough that came when God first brought him into the land. So you got focus, then you've got maintenance. All right, you can't push hard forever. Listen to what Jesus said, John 16, 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. It doesn't matter how fast a leader can run if he outpaces the people who follow him. If he goes too quickly, 
for the people who are behind him. The real success of a leader is not how much you can do individually. It's how well do you do when you're taking a group of people with you. You cannot run off and leave them. And so this is how Jesus spoke to his disciples. I have many things to say to you now. I said that in John 16, 12. Now here's what's fascinating. This is at the beginning of his passion when he says this. I mean, he's just weeks away, if not days away, from the crucifixion. And so after the crucifixion and resurrection, then Jesus unloads on the apostles. Read in Luke 24 how much he taught them on the night of the resurrection. It would have been pointless to teach them about this before because it took the resurrection for them to be able to understand. He released the Spirit onto them so they could really clearly understand. You read that in the book of John. You read it also in Luke 24. And so that night, Jesus gave them incredible insight. They were then able to bear it. And even over the next uh, 40 days, while he was appearing and reappearing to them, going back to heaven, coming back and forth, and and so uh, he finally ascended permanently to the right hand of the Father. But what I want you to see from all of this, they were able to receive things they could not have received before the Passion. And uh, then here's another thing that happened. Um, Jesus uh, told them about the church. They couldn't wrap their minds around it. And so when he was caught up to heaven in Acts, uh, the first chapter, one of their last questions to him was, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They're thinking about Israel, Israel, Israel. But then something happens on the day of Pentecost, and the church is born. Boom, it blows the whole thing up. And they're no longer talking about restoring the kingdom to Israel. They've got a whole new vision. There's another breakthrough. We'll talk more about that in the next few lessons. But the point that I want to make is is that God uses both focus and maintenance to work His kingdom. And there's a time for focus which brings breakthrough. And there's a time where you consolidate what you gained with the breakthrough. And that's done by maintenance. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 6, King James Version. Paul said, I have planted, that's focus. Apollos watered, that's maintenance, but God gave the increase. That's where the two of these things work together. So your business or your church, whatever it is you're doing, has these two periods. There's a time of focus. It's followed by time of maintenance. That's how God does his thing. You know, one of the best ways that I can explain what we're talking about today, the power of focus, and it's something that every every leader needs to know, is to use the axe as an example. Now, I'm going to bring up the axe that I got out of my garage. I want to show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, when most people think about the axe, they think about, okay, it's just, uh, uh, it's a very simple instrument. Actually, there are four major factors here in what makes this axe work. I remember taking an axe out to a big old pine tree when I was a kid. Man, I hit that tree hard as I could, and it didn't even dent the bark. And uh, I thought, how in the world did those old timers ever build log cabins and chop them down? And I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said, if I was going to spend 10 hours, 8 hours, however long, uh, chopping down a tree, I'd spend most of the time sharpening my axe. And uh, he was right. Uh, A dull axe doesn't work. But we're going to talk about how an axe can help you understand the importance of focus. Uh, Focus is huge. Uh, The axe head has to be substantial in order for it to work. And now just imagine that this axe head was made out of a lightweight fiberglass. It could have the same shape, it could have the same edge, but it is the mass of this. When you pick up this axe, you can immediately feel the weight in the head of this axe. 
This could be copper, and it still wouldn't work, or tin, it still wouldn't work. It works because it's heavy steel. So the axe head has to be substantial. In other words, if you are going to lead people into something that is going to work, you have to have something substantial to go after. Now, let me explain what I'm talking about. Years ago, uh, my business administrator made a very wise observation. He said, everything we pay for, all of our our notes, uh, all of our borrowing, everything is toward electronics. And that was true. We had borrowed for a uh, computer system. We had borrowed for our TV studio gear, all of our cameras, editing equipment, and so forth. And it was all depreciating in value rapidly. In other words, we weren't building any assets. He said, we need to go to our partners and ask them to help us to build some assets. And his thought was, let's go after a studio and an office building. And so we begin to drive and look for real estate. Now, at the same time, someone else came to me with the idea, have you ever thought about starting a camp? You've got this national ministry, and uh, there are thousands and thousands of children and families who look to you And it's uh, very reasonable for you to think about building a camp. And I thought about the two of these things. And the more I prayed about the camp and I put it before the Lord, the more I realized that was what God wanted me to do. Now, here's why I felt like that was uh, his direction. It is because we already leased a studio. Now, we didn't own it, but we leased it. We had access to it. And our partners would have had a very difficult time uh, funding a studio when it was obvious by the fact that we were producing these television shows that we already had one. Uh, they knew we already had offices. We had a mailing address. We had a street address. We, you could see our offices from time to time in our partner communications. And so they knew we had an office. We didn't own it, but we still had it. Whereas a camp was something brand new, and it had a certain romance to it. It would enable us to minister in a totally new dimension. So I chose to go after the camp, meaning that my first choice and focus was to do something that was substantial. The weight of the project has to be right. Secondly, You could take this handle out to a tree or take this head out to a tree without the handle and start chopping away like this. You would do some damage, but not nearly as much as what you get with the handle attached. This gives you leverage, and any leader knows how important it is to have leverage. Now, leverage is what a lot of people would think as momentum. I see it as just something a little differently. I see leverage as fruitfulness. In other words, when I have proven to be faithful with whatever it is I've done up until now, and I go to people and ask them to help me to do something new, I have leverage to make that request because they can see my fruitfulness. Now, if I've raised money for one project after another and we never got it done and it didn't work and there was no success with it and you couldn't see it working or producing any kind of fruit, that takes away all of my ability to raise new money or to lead people to a new thing because I don't have any leverage. I haven't done anything with the things you've given me up until this point. And so I want to make sure that when I raise money, when we do something, when we lead a charge, or when we have a campaign, I'm looking for a win. Now, what is a win? A win is a completed project that produces ongoing results. Let me say that again. A win is a completed project that produces ongoing results. Uh, I've said this many times in my leadership training sessions. Uh, you should only have one baby in a crib at a time. In other words, when you've got five projects going, none of them is completed. Uh, you, you, you are spending all kinds of energy, uh, whereas you could have had one project finished and that project begins to help you. It's like having children, and so your three-year-old helps you kind of watch your, your newborn baby a little bit. And then when that three-year-old is five, then you really get a lot more help. And so the thing that I want you to 
to see is, is that I think a lot of times we go after way too many things at once. None of them are completed, and it makes it very difficult for people to buy into the next thing that we do. Completion gives me currency. Now I'm going to bring you to the next thing. I could take this ax and I could swing it at the tree, but if I swing it very slowly, I don't have the effect that I want to have. And now we're talking about momentum. Now there's a difference between momentum and leverage. Uh, leverage is what I get when I have the longer handle here. But momentum is what I get when I swing with speed. Now, the leverage corresponds to the project and, and what I've done in the past to go after this project. But the momentum is the time frame. And what I want you to see is there are seasons when it's right to go after your projects. I've always instinctively known this is not a good time to raise money. I would have a check in my spirit. This is not the right time. There could have been some things in the economy I, I didn't know. I, I do know one thing for sure. Uh, back in 2000 and just before, we needed to build the 180 building. We could have launched it a year before we actually did it. But the Holy Spirit told me specifically, wait till after you get into the year 2000, then go after your campaign. Because too many people were fearful about Y2K. Now, our people shouldn't have been because I preached faithfully that there would be no crash. You go back and look, I never bought into the idea there was going to be a big crash in the year 2000, and I faithfully preached that. Uh, but a lot of people listened to the guys on TV who were constantly pushing this stuff and selling all kinds of, of um, uh, survival kits and all kinds of other things, and it turned out to be bogus and it didn't work. As soon as we got into the year 2000, February, I launched a campaign to go after the 180 building, a 90,000 square foot youth building, the most amazing youth building in America at that time. And uh, many times uh, since then, other people have copied and, and done similar things, but it was an amazing, and still is an amazing building. Now, my point is this, is we waited for the right time so I could have the right momentum. Momentum is the ability to move quickly. I knew I could move quickly and with a lot of people behind me because we had proven uh, that what we said about Y2K was the truth. And a lot of people said, we trust you, we believe in you, we know this is going to work, and we did. We had a very successful campaign. That is what we're talking about when we say momentum. How quickly can you swing the ax? Uh, another thing that I did, uh, you, many times is we had big days. I would set aside a big day, usually the first Sunday in May. And the reason is when we were a smaller, younger church, uh, our younger people would go to their parents' homes on Easter. And so we would actually drop a little bit on Easter uh, because we were not the go-to church. Now it's all changed because we've got older people, uh, but there was a season when we were not the go-to church on Easter. So I would have a big day. I knew that I needed at least seven weekends to push the big day. You cannot establish momentum with one Sunday's announcement. It took us seven weeks, and every week I intensified the announcements and the decor in the church and the campaign that I did in the city intensified. I bought billboards around town, but I didn't release them on the first day. I waited for the last four weeks for those billboards to take their effect. I didn't buy ads on Christian radio stations. I bought ads on the rock stations and the country western stations advertising our big day because I wanted it very clear. I am going after sinners. I'm going after people who are not walking with God. Uh, the Lord very specifically told me at the beginning of Church on the Move, don't mix the sheep. And lots of pastors do this. They will have a campaign or a crusade and advertise to the Christian community because they want to mix the sheep from several con congregations. And that's not a great church building strategy. It's very confusing and in some cases very unethical. So 
I didn't mix the sheep. We would go after the sinners. Uh, the decor in our lobbies, in the beginning, it would just be a couple of posters, but by the end of the campaign, we've got it everywhere. Uh, even the bathroom stalls, push for 2,000, pull for 2,000. Our first big day in 1990, our goal was 2,000 people. We pushed it for seven weeks. We had our big day, and on the big day, we had 2,800 people plus. Boy, did that give us momentum. Now, I want to talk to you about the last element of this, okay? This is the axe edge right here. And uh, this is not a great example uh, because I have not taken the time to sharpen this. But if it's going to do its work, this needs to be sharp. And the sharper and narrower this edge is, the more effective it's going to be. That's what focus is. So all of what we did in that seven-week period before we had the big day was the big day. That's it. We're not talking about tons of other things. I'm preaching messages about winning souls. I'm giving people boldness and sh doing skits, showing our people how to invite a guest to church. Focus, focus, focus. It was no accident then that when we had the big day, it was a huge success. Now, did we maintain the 2,800 people? No, we did not. We had been running 1,300 people before we had that big day. We had 2,800 on the big day, and we dropped down to about 1,700 people. So we still had an increase of 400 people right away, but within a year, we were averaging over 2,000 people. We got to where we were on the big day. You know what the big day did? It showed us all of our weak spots. It gave us a look at what it would take to bring 2,000 people to church every weekend. We saw weaknesses in our parking. We saw weaknesses in our nursery. We saw weaknesses in our assimilation process. We saw all these different weaknesses, and it gave us something to work on. And we went after it, and we turned the focus into maintenance. Now, that's another subject all, uh, 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 all together. I can't get into that today. But want you, want, I want you to see that the work of the ax has to do with four things. Number one, is your cause substantial enough? Does it have enough gravity to attract the interest of your congregation? Number two, do you have leverage? Have you been fruitful with what you've been given up until now? Number three, are you going to be able to focus uh, plainly enough and be energetic enough so that you keep your momentum, the speed of your swing has to be strong and quick if you're going to have a breakthrough? And finally, you have to stay very focused. Your edge has to be very narrow. You don't want to focus on about five or six different things. You want to focus on that one thing till you get it done. Then you have your big day and boom, uh, now you've got a breakthrough and something to build with. talking about leadership, and we've talked about a number of different things. First thing is about how important it is for a leader to be a self-starter. Secondly, we talked about the importance of confidence, that if a leader is not confident, that will ensure that his people won't follow him where they need to go. People can pick up on whether or not a leader is really confident. Then there is the leader's ability to delegate. You have to pass things on. And there's a process by which this is done. Finally, we come to the importance of focus. If you cannot stay focused, if you don't build with focus, you will not gain ground. A lot of people think that you can build a great church with just maintenance principles. You can't water the grass in front of your house and expect to produce a flower bed. There has to be a time of focus in order to get that flower bed established. Once it's established, then you can water. But uh, focus always comes ahead of maintenance. Now, focus brings breakthrough, but maintenance, on the other hand, consolidates our gains. Once you have a gain, uh, then you have to consolidate it. It won't stay if you don't take care of it. Now, what Jesus did when he established the church was he gave the apostles a focus. He said to them, tarry 
in Jerusalem, meaning everything was focused on them staying in Jerusalem. Now, they know that they're not going to be there forever because he had told them, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, go and make disciples of all nations. So they know there's going to be some going out. But for the moment, he says, I want you to tarry in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high. That's focus. He's gotten them zeroed in on Jerusalem, and they have probably figured out by now that something huge is going to happen on the day of Pentecost. And why is that? Well, they have already seen that the first three festivals that they have been told to observe by Moses in the law uh, the feast of uh, or the feast of unleavened bread. Jesus fulfilled that. He was examined. He was tested. They found no fault in him. He also purified the temple. In other words, unleavened bread is about taking the leaven out of bread. It's about getting rid of sins, and that's the focus of the Passion Week. The second thing was the crucifixion. Jesus exactly filled Passover, dying at 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the Passover lamb was killed. And so he fulfilled Passover. He was raised from the dead on the Feast of Firstfruits. So they have seen one, two, three feasts used as days to bring some breakthrough into Christ's program. They know there has to be another one coming on the Feast of Pentecost, or Shabbat, uh, which is, and I probably butchered that pronunciation, but it is the, the 50, it's 50 days after the, the Feast of First Fruits. And so uh, this is when Moses was caught up to the uh, top of the mountain and given the law, given the Ten Commandments. So they know that something is going to happen then. It actually is the birthday of the church. Now, Acts chapter 2, verses 41 through 43 we see here, then those who gladly received Peter's word were baptized that day. About 3,000 souls were added to them, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. That happened on the heels of the day of Pentecost. This is the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people saved. Great breakthrough here. And that's the thing that focus does. Focus on always results in an amazing breakthrough. And it says here that great fear came upon every soul. When you have a great breakthrough, there is a sense of awe that happens to you. First time I really ever saw this, uh, I had been saved, I think, for about four years, three years. Uh, we had a big day at the church that I worked in in Wheeler, Texas. My uncle was the pastor. The biggest crowd we'd ever had and that church was about 75 people. Most of the time we averaged in the 50s. Uh, but one time we had a family that had a reunion, brought all their family members, and we hit 75. Biggest crowd we ever had. We set a goal on Easter Sunday, 1973, to have 100 people in church. We really focused on that goal for seven weeks. We put it in front of our people. We encouraged everybody to show up on that day. It, it, we knew that we would be bigger if just everybody came to church on the same day. Uh, the other thing is that we gave out assignments and asked people to bring another guest, so invite somebody. And so when the big day happened, we had over 140 people in the church on that day. It blew us away. Now, let me tell you one of the last of these that I was associated with. In uh, 2011 on Easter Sunday, we determined that we were going to have an amazing day of water baptisms. And I took out some chairs and built some little platforms on either side of our platform that were waterproof and put uh, tanks in where we could baptize people in water. We set up uh, huge uh, numbers of changing stations. We got all kinds of people to volunteer to bring blow dryers, hairbrushes. Uh, many beauty shop owners came and brought all their stuff. We had uh, a rubber mats down so people could walk out of these baptismal tanks and not slip on the floor. We had the whole thing set up. And I told my staff before this ever happened, I said, this is either going to be the biggest flop we've ever known as a church, or it's going to be the greatest thing we've ever done as a church. 
it was the greatest thing. It, uh, we had almost a thousand people water baptized on that Easter weekend. It was incredible. Hundreds and hundreds of people kept coming in every service. And, it, and when the whole thing was over with, it was a day of awe. It was amazing. Another big day we had was in May of 1999. We called it Cowboy Sunday. We set a goal to hit 16,000 people. I'm sorry, 12,000 people. We hit 16. We blew the doors off the goal. And it was at the time the biggest crowd we'd ever had. And uh, it was amazing what came over us once we hit that goal. And when we looked back at how many people were saved and how many people came back into fellowship with Christ and uh, the people we reached, it was just an amazing event. So there's always a sense of awe that follows a breakthrough. The day of Pentecost was a breakthrough. It's how Jesus birthed the church. Now, it's not the only operation of the church because you can see they very quickly shifted into a new mode, and it's Acts 2.44. Now, all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily, remember that word, Daily, with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor uh, with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, do you see the difference here between the day of Pentecost and the aftermath? The day of Pentecost was that one breakthrough moment. In a very short period of time, 3,000 people came to faith in Christ. But then right after that, they, they consolidated their gains and these people followed through with what they had received on the day of Pentecost and there were people being saved daily. Now, it wasn't a huge breakthrough day like you had on the day of Pentecost, but this is maintenance. So we have focus, then maintenance, focus, then maintenance, focus, then maintenance. The thing that was on the mind of the apostles before the day of Pentecost was this. They wanted to know if the Lord was going to restore the kingdom to Israel at that time. And uh, Jesus said, it's not meant for you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has put into his own power. Now, this is fascinating. He didn't answer them because he knew that the day of Pentecost was going to change their thinking, and it did. And there's no more big talk about what's going to happen with Israel. They realized, oh boy. What Jesus said about this church, upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. They begin to see the church emerging out of Israel. And it wouldn't be long before they're seeing the church affected by the Gentiles because the Gentiles begin to come into it. So they had maintenance focus. They had focus then maintenance. And this is how it began. Breakthrough events are focused on a dominant personality, while maintenance operations involve many people. When the day of Pentecost hit, the Bible says in Acts 2.14, but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea, <clears throat> I was saved through a breakthrough event. It was focused on an evangelist who had an amazing gift in communicating with young people. And it created a week of intense excitement at the particular church where I was saved. Uh, over uh, 900 young people were saved in this week. 2,000 people in the services that week in the auditorium. Amazing things happened uh, that week. Numbers of us came to Christ. I was saved in that breakthrough moment. Now, as soon as the meeting was over, everything got back down to normal. It was then important for me to maintain and so I had to develop an ongoing relationship with God and maintain my walk with God. And uh, I felt like in my case, I was directed to my grandmother's church and that's where I went. Uh, that's where my maintenance began. And so uh, there was a great breakthrough moment. Then there was maintenance. Uh, you see these things happening over and again. Now the church had a number of these breakthrough moments. Here's another one. This is... Uh, 
um, this uh, uh, event that happened in Acts chapter 3 when this crippled man was healed at the gate beautiful. Acts 3, 11. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. There's this sense of awe. So when people or when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why do you look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? And he talks about how this man was healed through the name of Jesus. Now, there's another breakthrough. With this event, there were 5,000 people who came to faith in Christ shortly thereafter. So you've got these two big breakthrough events, but then they are followed up with consolidation events. Uh, once they had uh, all of these people saved, they had to select deacons to take care of the daily administration of food. You, it's a maintenance thing that they had to respond to in Acts chapter 6. Listen to Acts 5.42. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. And daily is emphasized all through the book of Acts. So you've got these two things going on. Focus, maintenance. Focus, maintenance. Focus, maintenance. You have to have breakthrough moments. But when they're done, you have to follow them up with maintenance or you won't be able to keep what you gained with your breakthrough. Wrapping up our series today on the four things that every leader needs to know. And by the way, there are many more than four, but I've chosen to focus on four. And if you haven't listened to this entire series, especially if you're a leader, I would recommend that you go back and catch the very first of these and come all the way down through them because we talk about four very, very important concepts. Joshua chapter 1 and verse 6, I'm going to get into something just a little different today as we wrap this up. Joshua said, or God said to him, be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall you divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers to give them. Now when we think about Joshua and the people of Israel taking possession of the land of Canaan, we think about it primarily in corporate terms. We see this map that changed from Canaan to Israel. But if you had a magnifying glass and could look at this in the finer points, you would realize that every little piece and plot of land was given to an individual Israeli family. In other words, it was not only a corporate victory, it was an individual victory. Wise leaders know how to make this link. In other words, when God calls us to do something corporately, it is because He wants to bless families individually. This is exactly what God said to Joshua. Let me read it again. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shall you divide for an inheritance the land which I swear to their fathers to give them. God gave ownership of each parcel to an Israeli family. Now, there's a link then between corporate and individual blessing. The two of these things go together. Uh, it's very similar to the link between focus and maintenance. Focus, maintenance. There was a season when all of the people of Israel had to focus on taking the land from these ungodly tribes of Canaanites who lived in the land. They had to drive them out. That was a focus period. Once they got their land, now they're farming, they're raising crops, they're raising animals. Now they're into the maintenance mode. So you see that it was a balance of the two things. And the same thing happens corporately with that individual process. When you raise money, when you go after anything, don't just think about what you're going to do as a corporation or as a group. We're focused on building a new auditorium or whatever it is you're going after. Remember this, it has to do with blessing for the people. 
And when I would raise money at Church on the Move to build some of the buildings we built, over 400,000 square feet of buildings in Tulsa and then another 200,000 square feet of buildings out at Drygo. So I've done quite a bit of building. And one of the things that I have always talked about is I'm, I'm not embarrassed to ask you for help. And I'm not ashamed to ask you to give to this because I know what's going to happen. God is going to bless your family for what you do corporately for this church. I, I can guarantee you that there is going to be a blessing on you. My wife and I saw it. When we gave sacrificially, when we did give to our church, even though we were in leadership, we gave sacrificially. We didn't ask people to do something that we ourselves did not do. In fact, I can't do that. that I think that's one of the reasons that I was so good at getting people to give to what we were doing. It is because that Deliva and I knew that we sacrificed as much as anybody. We were not the least bit hesitant to ask other people to help because we knew that this is a way of life for us. When we moved to Tulsa, God spoke to us and said, give away the money that you have coming from the sale of your home in Texas. Uh, we could have tithed on what we made from the sale of that house, but we chose to do something more. God called us to give him everything. And he told me, he said, I'm going to teach you something with this. And so we gave up all of our house money. Now, I thought that God would pay us back, but I figured it would take decades for that to happen. Uh, and he did repay us over the decades, but we had a new home within three months. And I don't know how we did it. It was supernatural how we got the money. After we gave up all of our home equity, we got the money to put into a new house in a market where houses cost three times as much as they did out there in that small town in West Texas. Now, we learned that if you bless the kingdom individually, or corporately rather, it's going to come back on you individually. And you can see this in the book of Joshua. God told Joshua to divide the land. So you have all of these corporate victories. You have the victory in Ai, the victory in Gibeon, the victory in all these other cities where they drive out the Canaanites. But listen to this. This is the book of Joshua chapter 15 and verse 13. Now to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he gave a share among the children of Judah according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, namely Kiriot Arba, which is Hebron. Arba was the father of Anak. They were giants. And uh, Caleb drove out the three sons of Anak from there, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. So K uh, Caleb went after those giants. He wanted that area because the giants lived there, and he wanted to take them out. He wanted to do it 40 years before and felt like they were able, but the children of Israel were in unbelief and they couldn't go in. And then he went up there to the inhabitants of Debir. Formerly the name of Debir was Kiriat Sefer. And Caleb said, he who attacks Kiriat Sefer and takes it, to him I will give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. So Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. Uh, so what you see here is this uh, obtaining of individual land, individual estate. You see it when they are conquering the land corporately. In other words, every corporate victory also involves individual victory. And so God wants to show your people that when they bless his kingdom, they are going to bring a great blessing on their own home. Now, I want to show you further how this works. This is the book of 2 Kings chapter 4. And it begins in verse 1, a certain wife or a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. Now this woman obviously was married to a man who had been known for his honoring and respect for God, and apparently he was a generous man as well. So Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house but a jar of oil. And, and I want you to notice how negative she is here. Uh, she's focusing on the, the small amount of oil. It's not much. It's nothing compared to what I need. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. 
And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons, then pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Now he is telling her, God is going to insist that you use what's in your hand. And so that little jar of oil she had was not nearly enough to pay the bill, but it was what she had, and the prophet said, you're going to have to use that. You will not always have what you need, but in every situation you face, you'll always have a seed. What is your seed? Sometimes your seed is some kind of action. It's not always money. It's not some giving a gift to a, well, to a big ministry or whatever. Uh, I, you know, there are times when God may lead you to give like that. But the point that I'm making is uh, it's not just about uh, triggering some kind of miracle when you give to somebody who claims to have a great miracle ministry and receiving your gifts, and then you're going to get rich as a result. This woman took what she had and she used it as a seed. In fact, she didn't even give it away. She used it to pour into these vessels. So she borrowed all of these empty vessels, actually did it before she needed those vessels. Now, I told the Lord one time very foolishly, I said, Lord, I don't know why you didn't just cause that little jar to start spewing out and then they run next door and get all the vessels. And the Lord told me, he said, it would have created an, a tremendous amount of waste and God doesn't waste things. So she filled all, or she got all these empty containers first. God told her to shut the the door. That's to keep her no, nosy neighbors out uh, because nosy neighbors bring unbelief and she didn't need to be ridiculed. She wasn't that strong in faith here. And so uh, she has to shut the door. So they pour out of this little jar into all these containers and pretty soon they're all filled. And she doesn't know next what to do. So she goes to the prophet. They're all full. He said, well, go sell it and uh, pay your debt and live on the rest. Now, this is what I want you to see. God blessed a house. What do I mean by that? Paul said to the Philippian jailer, uh, he said, you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved in all your house. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God's not just after the salvation of individuals. God wants to get into families. I married into a family where a grandmother feared God, loved God, prayed, obeyed God with what little money she had to give. And I watched God turn the entire family around with seven children, did amazing things for them. I married the granddaughter of that lady. And that blessing is still on our family today. It's what I coveted, and, and it now is on my children. I see God doing amazing things for my kids because we brought God's blessing on our house with our faith and with our obedience. So I want you to see this spiritual law that when we do something together, when you take a group of people and you have a great focus for a breakthrough, it will be followed by maintenance. But listen to me, every great corporate victory you have will be followed by individual victories. We constantly pray for the prosperity of our people. And we have seen God give them businesses and breakthrough and properties. And it's amazing because they cared about his house. You cannot separate the two. 